Hello, everybody out there in podcast land. Welcome to the Sense and Signal podcast, where we explore organizational leadership through the lens of sense making, because you can't really make good decisions without making good sense of the world uh, in which we live. So uh, I'm your host, one of your co-hosts, Daniel Tarker, and I am here with Joda Shenson, the other co-host. And Joda and I, I think it's an interesting pod, one uh, interesting aspect of this podcast is that Joda and I have known each other for, I don't know, 20 something years, uh, probably more, but we probably don't want to talk about as how many years because we were both probably kind of feeling long in the tooth. But we uh, met in college and took di- two totally different career traje- trajectories. Uh, I went into higher education and I'm an administrator, uh, an educator. Uh, and so I, I bring that background to the conversation. And Joda, what did you do after college? Yeah, uh, pretty much went down. Uh, I mean, we were in San Francisco, you know, so yeah. uh, went down the sort of uh, the uh, dot com rabbit hole at the time. And I've been in pretty much product development uh, for uh, software for quite a while uh, now. Um, like you said, I don't want to mention any years here, uh, but um, in, in recent years, a lot of my efforts have been around um, uh, enterprise solutions uh, revolving on big data. Um, mm-hmm. business intelligence, security, uh, vulnerability management, things like that. Some of that stuff you might, some of y'all might have heard of, some of you might not have heard of, but basic is trying to leverage all of this information that companies collect today and uh, turn it into something that um, they can use for various purposes. So, uh, yeah, yep, I would say we bring two arguably two different, different paths. <laughs> two different paths and two very different lenses after so many decades working in our respective fields to our understanding of organizational leadership and uh, sense-making. And so uh, today, uh, what we want to talk about is complexity, um, and specifically complexity in terms of tackling complex problems. And Joda and I have done a deep dive into the Kinevin um, framework by David Snowden and uh, his cohort of consultants, um, and, uh, you know, to try and tackle... So I think, you know, for the reason I'm interested in it, I'll be interested to hear why Joda's interested in it. I think um, if anything, trying to maneuver the world during COVID and as an organizational leader and manager and how to, how to keep systems running and how to keep the organization going during the COVID pande- uh, COVID-19 pandemic has shown what a truly complex world we live in and um, has made me much more interested in how to uh, understand complexity and how to lead in a complex situation and how to identify complex problems. What about you, Jonah? Yeah, I I think, uh, I'm not sure if it's been COVID driven. um, Although it's been- For me it is. Yeah, for me, although I would say it's exasperated probably a lot, right? Um, a lot of things have, have manifested in ways um, uh, because of COVID or were or, or exaggerated in ways because of COVID. Um, so admittedly, um, you know, um, Dan, Dan introduced me to David Snowden um, a little while ago and, and, and I hadn't really, I really didn't dive into him that much. Um, he knew that I was sort of exploring systems thinking. And then so he brought up David Snowden, not to be confused with, uh, what's his name? Richard Snowden or Edward okay. Snowden? Edward Snowden. Um, yeah, Edward yeah, the Snowden. guy is off in Russia. The guy, the Russian guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of the United States. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. The two di- two different people. Um, and so uh, he, he he's more. Uh, um, David Snowden is more of a um, a complexity theory guy, but they kind of meet in the middle. And and to, it's. I mean, it seems to me. Um, and. You know, recently I kind of Dan brought this brought him up again, and so I kind of dove into this complexity theory space a little bit. So I'm a newbie to complexity theory on on some level. Um, I'm a newbie to David Snowden, um, but I do want to learn more because there is something there's something interesting there, 
And like I said, I, I think there's a bridge between systems thinking and, and, and complexity thinking. And, and I, I thought it was interesting that David Snowden in one of his talks kind of referred to systems thinking. He said, you can tell the difference between a, a systems thinker and a complexity thinker, where systems thinkers think of a finite space. There's a system and that, and there's everything is contained within that system where complexity says, actually, those are fuzzy barriers. And it, to truly understand a system, you have to understand the entire complexity of the greater uh, uh, environment and that there is no def like clear def definitions, you know, so there's a, um, yeah, it, it, it is fascinating. And I, and I, I want to caveat as well that I'm no expert in this. I, um, have, uh, watched several of Snowden's videos, um, on YouTube. And I've also read, uh, the Kinevin book that they've, uh, published through his consultancy, um, and read some other materials by him and, and uh, you know, done some basic um, teaching, you know, around some of his concepts and, and the, the general framework as a sense-making tool. And um, to speak to the, 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 the systems thinking aspect, what, what I even learned last night while watching one of his uh, presentations or another interview he did on a podcast was, you know, that he does make a real differentiation that complexity is kind of a stage above systems thinking, right? Like they're, they're, it isn't complex systems for him at least. And there's some dispute in that community about his interpretation, which he acknowledges, but that from his vantage point and the framework that he's using, you have systems theories, you have systems theory. And as we know, um, systems theory is something that has evolved over the 20th century um, um, in various different iterations um, and that, uh, you know, and what he's, I, I get a sense that he's arguing now is like systems theory is no longer enough to explain the phenomenon of our, of the, of the world, uh, and the interconnectedness of the world. And that now you need to take it a level up to, uh, complexity theory, which is kind of building off of systems th thinking. And, and to your point, Joda, I, I always thought, you know, I remember studying systems theories and, you know, the idea of open systems versus closed systems to semi-open systems, you know, as, as part of the terminology, it makes sense what he's saying that the, the, the membrane, these barriers that systems theory so often talks about, um, and even gets to a point at some point where it's like, you're an open system. Well, what's the difference between an open system and just complexity where everything is just kind of interconnected? Um, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting to think about. Because I do see, you know, especially during our times, how interconnected uh, everything is. Um, and we can see it with the supply chain issue right, that we're uh, dealing with right now. Uh, the global, the, how global interconnectedness can impact us at our uh, local supermarket. Yeah. Yeah, I... Um yeah, and, and let's be clear, you and I, we're not here to kind of discuss the disputes between systems and, and, and complexity necessarily. Those are academic, at, 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 and they're probably often worst, <laughs> at their worst, uh, trying to sort of carve off their little niches in their academic worlds to some degree, and perhaps having fun at being provocative. Uh, that kind of captures attention when there's little battles. Uh, but um, <laughs> but I'm sure there's an also some, some variations in how things are thinking. Um, but what, what we're trying to do, what you have to really be though, to get into a Twitter war over systems theory on. <laughs> they, they, they exist. That's the way it, it's just, um, we got, there's more than 7 billion people. So you, it, at some point you're going to have them, you know, so going to have fun getting. <laughs> yeah. Getting yeah. And, and you know what? I think we're going to probably try to do that ourselves at some point in time. You know? So, oh, but, yeah. but you know, for me, you know, the reason why I'm interested in this space and we, we talked about this recently, Dan, and, and that is that, I'm, you know, in my efforts of producing stuff where, like I said, I'm, I've been basically a product designer for several years. Um, the area that has always been, not always, but as I matured in my space, the area that has intrigued me the most um, in the product development cycle has been less about the creation process, less about the development process. Those are almost to some degree, oh gosh, help me down. That's a, um, 
let me let me hear that's a i'm gonna jump the jump the gun here but that's sort of a that's a complicated domain it's complicated yeah. but not necessarily complex always i mean and there can be complex aspects to it but but the parts that have that have troubled me the most and i felt have been most problematic in the spaces that i've worked in um not just for myself but from an organizational perspective are the earlier stages of trying to understand basically get the sense and the signals and being rigorous enough to identify relevant signals um, and which uh, that are important and then cataloging those and structuring them those so that teams can get an alignment around those and feel confident that they're moving forward. I feel most of the time that, that, that process, that early stage um, is done half ass, you know, it, it's, it, and, and I can kind of understand why. And that is because, you're, it feels like you're not making anything, you know. Um, I use a terminology oftentimes, the difference between, well, there's a thing I use called a provotype, P-R-O-V-O-T-Y-P, um, invented word, I can't remember who, the, the, the woman who, who coined the terminology, but I like it, as opposed to a prototype. And a prototype is where basically where you're going to present something. It's, it's, an, it's a definition of a solution, and you say, hey, is this going to work for you? A provotype is not necessarily a def definition. Provo, like provoke, provoke, right? It's meant to to um, art to not articulate anything specific, but uncover and discover um, potential needs and values and, and problems around a space utilizing visualizations or tool visual tools. And so I use the terminology. A prototype is kind of like a hammer. You're actually constructing stuff. Where a prototype is a shovel, where you're uncovering and discovering. And I mm -hmm. I've come to the conclusion that companies don't like those phases as much, or oftentimes I think it's because I think you can you can find yourself getting into a morass of complexity that you don't know necessarily how to get out of. And eventually I think you just kind of need that strong person personality that says, okay, this is what we're going to do. And if, if nothing else changes, I think that's probably what you have to do at times. But I think it's that early stage of complexity that's intrigued me. And if, and understanding complexity theory and its nuances and the tools that, that, people like Snowden perhaps are providing us can help us. I would love to learn more about that and, and leverage those tools in these early stages of product development. So that's why I'm interested. I hope that wasn't too long winded. No, no, no. And I, I'm kind of interested for similar reasons I, where you work on products. Uh, I, you know, in higher ed, I kind of work more on programs uh, and people management in, in, in many respects. Uh, whether it's uh, faculty or students or staff um, and other administrators. Um, and so, and I feel like, you know, higher ed is definitely a complex environment. It would meet, meet the definition of, of, of what a complex organization is. And I also feel like we deal with very complex problems um, all the time. And that's kind of what I'm interested in, like for today's episode to kind of focus on is like, what is a complex problem? Because, uh, I think that's what initially got me interested in looking at this theory or this framework was, you know, wanting to understand how do I identify a complex problem and what should I do once I've identified that I'm in that space, right? So, um, so Dan, so Dan, we've been we're, we're dancing around it. What, yeah. So what is, what is yeah? What is a complex problem? Well, I think, and and the, what is it not? What what like yeah, we were talking for sure. So, um, and I'll probably throw a, a visual aid up here on the screen at this point. Uh, so look for that if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, <laughs> or, and if you're listening on audio, uh, go to YouTube and find us. And you're just S O L. Stuff. We'll we'll have a verbal and, uh, description of it. Joda's beautiful face. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's a hunk. He's a hunk. Ooh. Come on, Joda. <laughs> very he's hairy married, hunk. Though, so you can't have him if you <laughs> if you find him and find him attractive on YouTube. You can't have him. Okay. Anyways, where, where are we going with this? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you have this uh, Kinevin framework, this framework that David Snowden uh, developed, and it's it is um, you want to think of it as four quadrants. Um, you know, a top row of two and a bottom row of two. And so we'll refer to it as, as these quadrants. And in the center of those four quadrants is that space I was just talking about, that uncertain space. I don't know where I'm at. I'm in one of these. Uh, the problem I'm facing is one of these four quadrants, but I don't know what it is, right? Because I'm having some sense-making problems. I often have those. 
just ask Joda. <laughs> um, all right, so, um, so the Kunev. <laughs> <laughs> so every so every knows. I just I paused. I just stand and stop talking for a second. Oh, we're picking it's up like now. Damn, <laughs> 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 you stop it. Stop talking, Dan. <laughs> I will shut up. <laughs> All right. You're going to be Go. married soon, too, buddy. I know. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, Jonah told me to uh, be quiet and stop explaining the whole framework. So I, I, I'm <laughs> just going to stop. <laughs> like an obedient husband, I'm going to follow his orders. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, we're not, I'm not going to go into the whole Kinevin framework. Hopefully you'll be able to dis, you, I would recommend going and reading about it and trying to discern what it is because um, we're going to be making reference to it. But um, it does have four quadrants to it. Uh, a, the simple domain, a simple problem, orderly problems, um, and then the, uh, the comp complicated, the complex, and the chaotic. And you are centered in the center of these four different quadrants trying to figure out which one you're in, right? So, wait, what, so is a um, what is a simple domain then? Well, I mean, the simple domain, again, is like just a simple problem that you could, like how to screw in a light bulb, right? Um, or how to uh, tie your shoe. I mean, it's something that you don't really need any cons consultation to figure out. You you have the cognitive schemas built into your mind to be able to figure out what you're supposed to do in that situation. Complicated takes it up to well, another real, level. Right? Well, before you move on, let me, let me, so there were a couple other things I thought that were interesting that I, that I had read or listened to it, um, where they made a statement that, that the, that they, that the relationships are obvious in a simple problem, right? Yeah. And that the, that, you know, the connections are, they're clear and you can apply best practices. You'll get repeatable results by applying best practices over and over again. That it, that's, that's sort of a, a simple problem, right? Something exactly. like that. Exactly. And, you have the best practices. You already know what you're supposed to do. Relationships are all clear. You can predict um, how things will occur or how, how relationships will manifest or outcomes. Okay. That's a simple problem or a, a situation. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take, I wrote a blog post about this. I'm going to take you through the analogy I used in the, my blog post as I, I kind of go through these, but in the blog post, I, I kind of, for simple, I was like, okay, well, my lights won't turn on in the bathroom. Clearly, if it's a simple problem, it's just that I need to change the light bulb, right? I understand the relationship between the switch and the light bulb. I go in, I change the light bulb, and it doesn't it doesn't go come on when I flip the switch. And I'm like, oh well, now it's more than just a simple problem. Now it's getting to the complicated domain, right? So that's the other quadrant uh, above the simple is that you um, you might need some more expertise now. Because you don't understand what the relationship is uh, between, and I'm, you know, things are contextual, right? So if I were an electrician, uh, that problem might not necessarily elevate to a complicated problem because, you know, an electrician has the knowledge to be able to address that situation. I don't. I'm not an electrician, so for me, it's complicated. So I have to call on some experts to help me figure it out. So I get on the phone. I call the electrician to come over and look at my light bulb. Right. And he goes in and checks out some things uh, and does some tests and realizes, oh, well, um, this is this is more comp uh, complex than I thought, because I can't before you move expertise. before I you move on to that. I, I want to like uh, there's a couple of points I would like to kind of, again, yeah. touch on for the complicated. Right. Like yep. so one of the things that they mentioned was that um, with a complicated problem that although it's more complicated, like we said, from than a, than a simple one um, where the relationships are obvious, where we assume that with a complicated problem, the, the perhaps the relationships aren't necessarily quite as obvious, but he made a comment that, um, that there's, that you can, in a complicated problem, analysis can get you to the right answer. Like simple analysis yeah. can get you there. Um, he also said it's a space that you can trust your experts to your point, your electrician. So, you know, wiring a house is a complicated problem. Um, but, and you might not be able to know that you might, you know, don't know how to do it. Um, it's something you could become 
it easily by studying the books and learning to be a learning to be an electrician. But instead, you typically will pay somebody for that expertise, and that sort of is also qualified as a complicated thing. And then, what I found interesting was, and I don't know where, and this is David Snowden said, uh, uh, and I'm not sure uh, where he got these statistics, but he made a comment that um, 90% of design problems are the are in the space of complicated problems. Um, I don't know if he was just kind of throwing a high number out or if that's an actual number. I don't know how he would have done it, but that's I would, interesting. I would say the same thing in, in just organizational leadership too. I mean, most, I think, you know, most of the time when things are, when the environment's relatively stable and things are just humming along, most of the problems are probably falling in the complicated domain. Yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to. And, and it's important that to note, like I think in his framework too, like, um, the complicated and simple or orderly problems are actually kind of part of the same domain. Um, he just splits it. They split it up just so, to, you know, to have another category to show that just kind of elevating elevation uh, in complexity, but it's not, there's still part of that orderliness. There's the orderliness there, but then sure. you get into uh, complexity, right? And so going back to my, um, electrician analogy so he does um some tests on he's in the complicated domain still and he's doing some tests on my lighting and testing the outlets and boy i don't see why where the electricity is and then he starts asking me about uh well have there been any construction uh in the house and i remember oh yeah we had this other room remodeled and then he goes and looks over there kind of getting into that systems approach to kind of like let's diagnose the systems of the house and realizes, oh, it's this other outlet that's messed up, not the one here. And so here we've entered a, a range of complexity, I would argue, because there could have been multiple variables out there uh, causing the, uh, the disruption of electricity to the outlet in my bathroom, right? Um, and he had to go through a process of probing to kind of figure out, you know, probing me for background information, uh, probing, uh, doing some experiments to see uh, if something would work to uh, identify where the the disruption in the the lighting systems were what was at. So, um, and so I think when we get to complexity, is you know you're in this area where there could be multiple different variables uh, contributing to the emergence of this problem. And you're having a hard time. There's high levels of ambiguity um, around that. And so you're trying to f use different methods to figure out um, how to get into, uh, you know, how to manage this complex problem you're, you're dealing with. Yeah. How do yeah. you like my analogy there with the, the electrician? Yeah, I think, I think, it, I think it fits. Um, so... So what does this mean for like what we're trying to talk about here, right? So I, I, I found it in, one of the things that David mentioned early in one of his talks was that he, he and I think this is sort of the key to everything he's talking about, and that is how do you design for serendipity, right? How do mm -hmm. you plan how because in these in these complex environments. Um, what was it that he said? He said, well, complex environment, uh, the only thing you do know in a complex environment is that you will have unintended consequences. And another thing he said that is that complex environments fail all the time. That's interesting. And I'm not exactly sure what he means by that 100%. I can kind of intuit what he means by that. But I'd be curious about more specifics, like what is the uh, how he how he qualifies failure. Failure is very very specific terminology, and I think oftentimes what it's we kind I, of in the eye of the beholder, like beauty. Well, I mean, failure. I mean, like you know, you go out like you and I have discussed this. You go out and do research to, to to validate something, and it comes about invalidated. Is that failure? I wouldn't qualify that as failure. That was that you just found out that it wasn't you were wrong, but it, that was ways, it's a success. It's a success right? as long as you got that data, right? It's a failure if yeah. you come back with not knowing what the answer is. That would be possibly qualified as a failure, but if you got your answer right, so I'm curious what he means by failure. But but I, I can get into it. You know what he means by that 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 things are compl are so complicated that that your in, your intentions to make something happen often come to not. Right, they, they won't happen um, because of the. And I think if you're trying to address the complexity in order to move, 
because you can move from these domains, right? You can move from move a problem from being complex to complicated to simple, right? Um, and that maybe what he's saying is that it's it's, it's difficult. You fail. You're failing at doing that. It's going to remain a complicated or complex problem as much as tr- try as you might to move it into another domain like complicated or or uh, simple. Because I think a lot, you know, and I don't want to. I, I just want to pin this here. I, I don't want to lose track of the chaotic domain, the fourth domain. Mm. I do think that's important, but we can come back to that later. Um, but there's an aspect of what he talks about that I find fascinating that deal, deals with evolution and. Um, how we um, an energy, right? Because you know, from an evolutionary point of view, we want to conserve energy, um, and so when you're in a complicated or complex, and when you're in a complex environment, you're expending a lot more energy to solve the problem or to do address the situation you're in. Whereas when you're in a simple environment, you're expending less energy. So we're always probably trying to want to get to simplicity. So you're you're expending the less that's my interpretation of, of some of this I can, um, I can see that i mean that that makes that makes sense i mean if complex environments for many of us is probably uncomfortable i would assume yeah no i th- and i think yeah i think and i think we see it i think that's why we're already still always taxed these days it's probably a direct correlation because the world's not getting any simpler um it just seems to be getting more and more complex and i think you know one of the things i think is important about this um framework is the chaotic domain too where things are high extreme levels of ambiguity and danger um and you know where it's really just impossible to make sense of what's going on um and that's when i guess when the fire is completely turned up right uh and lots of energy is getting expended to try and get things back to an orderly place. Um, and I think there's a thin, well, he has these liminal spaces between these do- domains and there's a really important liminal, uh, liminal space between the simple and the chaotic. And the, you know, if you misinterpret a, situ- a, a problem as simple, when in fact it is actually complex, it can spiral into chaos he actually gives Um, a a neat a neat story on that i think and it's under the complex domain and i don't know if that would result would end in chaos but you can see why it would i mean if you were to leverage it i thought it was an interesting story and where he talked about and i think it was back a long time ago or something where they were looking at improving people's efficiencies at the office and they 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 uh something they got a signal that suggested that that people will improve their efficiencies if you increase the light where they're working. So they did something where they increased the light across the board. I, I got the I got the way he told it, it sounded like 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 public power churned up power and all the lights went up or so. I I'm not exactly sure about the whole the whole study exactly how it went. But there's some place they increased the lights in these areas where people were making stuff and they got signals that, oh my gosh, that's right. Right. And that would, that was a confirmation of a, and from their mind that we are dealing with a, perhaps a complicated domain, meaning that it, it's it's it, or maybe even a simple domain where it was a, a, the correlation and causation was very simple. Turned out though that that wasn't true, and what it was because what happened is, and I don't know who did it again. He, he ran through this really quickly, but someone decided to flip it and said, you know what, we're going to lower the light, and they lowered the light, and productivity went up again. So it wasn't about the light quality or, or intensity that was the, it was it turned out it was novelty of, of, of environment somehow stimulated people to work more or more efficiently. Changing things in the environment effectively was what was not not the specifics of light. So defining it as a complex problem, right? Is it wasn't it was this weird complexity issue. And um, to your point, you know, if you define it as simply churning up the light. Um, well, you would, could find yourself turning up the light on everything, and yet you would start getting less and less returns on that. And if you believed it was light, you could see people live, working in these pure, bright, uh, horrific white rooms where they're thinking, we just got to crank that light up more, and people are going to be like, and it's not working because it wasn't the light. It was the novelty of a change in space. 
And so that yeah. would then possibly cause chaotic environments and stuff like that. So I thought that was an interesting anecdotal story that he said. He kind of ran through it really quickly, but it, it stuck with me. Yeah, he runs through a lot of stuff, <laughs> stuff quickly. He does. Uh, it's a lot to absorb. And it's all very complex. He's a brilliant guy. I mean, um, you know, able to extrapolate lots of references and knowledge to compose his points uh, from a lot of different domains of knowledge. Uh, from literature to science to, um, you know, business and IT and software design. Uh, so, yeah, so fascinating stuff. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, uh, and the analogy I used for, you know, the the uh, going back to my electrician for the chaotic uh, domain was, well, if the, um, the electrician at the complex level doesn't diagnose uh, my uh, electrical problem correctly, my house might burn down. <laughs> that'd, that'd be pretty. That'd be pretty chaotic. Throw me into the chaotic domain. No. Or if I um, I thought it was a simple problem, and I uh, didn't even call an electrician and um, put in the light bulb and kept fiddling with it, and because I'm a novice, I don't know what I'm doing, I trigger something that sets my house on fire because I didn't appreciate the complexity of the situation I was dealing with. That could also uh, push me through the liminal space and the chaos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, we, we're kind of talking about this academically uh, on, on some level. So what does this mean? So you and I talked about it and you asked me, and I kind of already said at the beginning of the space, you know, what is it that, why do I find this, why do I find this to be interesting? Um, and in organizations, we're, we're just trying to get stuff done, right? You're making something, you're yeah. setting something up and you, and, and oftentimes the question of when you're moving forward and getting stuff done, you're trying to have you're leveraging the knowledge you have and identify the knowledge you don't have to, to move forward. And uh, like I said at the beginning of this cast is that I feel that at times the rigor to identify the distinctions of what you know and don't know, the relationships of those distinctions, um, identifying the various perspectives of those distinctions. Um, and for those of your systems thinking, yes, I'm using those terminologies. And I think that Hard to. Yeah. So, and, and it's important, you know, and, and, and so, and when you're in a, when you're in a complex environment, those things can be fungible at times. And what was it? He said something that might be right this time won't be right next time. So when you right. add two plus two, now you get four, but next time it's going to be seven in a complex environment. So how do you deal with that sort of, how do you deal with that, that, Movability of reality that 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 that, that you know I mean it, it's, I, it, I appreciate you you um, using the term movability of, of reality because I was listening to and I can't, unfortunately can't remember the the uh, person who delivered this lecture but it's a great lectures on complexity theory um, I'll try to put a, uh, uh, a mention of it in the show notes um, but he uses the term dancing mountains. Um, to describe that environment because they're not fixed mountains. They're constantly moving. They're shifting, you know? Um, and so, yeah. So how do you, yeah. How do you na navigate that constantly shifting environment? Yeah. So like I said, we are exploring this with all, with all y'all who are watching this. So, you know, stay tuned for more, but I think that one of the key takeaways here is that, I found a couple couple points that were interesting, and that was he he had made a statement that um, perhaps doing these five year projections in a complex environment um, is not worth it. In fact, it might be detrimental. And he he delineates a couple of reasons why. Um, not not to, I mean, the easy one. I mean, in a complex environment, the easy reason is because things are changing all the time. So what you basing your decision on right now is actually going to be different two days from now or six months from now. So it just makes your decision at that moment only valid for the moment, not for what happened. But there's other reasons. He's also said it alludes, it can, it can drive confirmation bias and things like that to drive things. And, 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 and because we live by our perceptions that you will get some of these confirmations of, of, of your perceptions as you're moving forward. And in a complex environment, if you do that, you're going to find yourself in the big, 
in in, in 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 lots of problems, lots of areas, lots of problem areas. So, and he and he, he rattles off a couple other reasons why it's problematic. So, I think that his solution is that is to try to leverage emergent intelligent structured emergent behavior. So that's problematic. I mean, not problematic. I mean, that's <laughs> easier said than done, right? I mean, it's really hard to kind of set up um, models by which you can generate an emergent behavior that one is maybe one predictive, but if not predictive, at least serendipitous enough to be meaningful for you. And that's why at the he. That's why I like that thing where he said we're trying to figure out how to how to extract information from some or extract value from serendipity. That's the crux of his argument, I think. And the question is to you and us: is is that the crux of your argument in your company? Do you have a vision, a five year vision, or are you willing to leverage serendipity? To, to to define what your your company or organization wants. And if not, what does that mean to you in a complex environment? I find that to be interesting. No, I, I find it interesting too. And as you as, as, as I was listening to you summarize some of his points, um, kind of brought me back to some other things I've listened to him say. And he, I, I get the impression that he would not be a big fan of strategic planning, a long-term strategic planning you know, looking at mission and, and values and uh, things like that, you know. Um, yeah, and I, you know, and then working within a, getting to your point about what, you know, if you're an organizational leader, whether you're in business or nonprofit or education, whatever, um, and you're in a complex environment or you're in a complex, um, you're facing a complex problem, what to do? How do, how do you make decisions in that environment. Um, and I, I appreciate the multiple safe to fail probes approach that he offers. Um, I know you and I have talked about agile in the past. It seems like it's very similar. And he does to too. No, he brings it up and, and his, he brings up agile a lot. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, he's a fan of agile. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and the, the, those probes that he talks about seem very in the same family of, of management approach, right? Like, okay, so you can't determine what's going to work, and it might be different each time because of the environment you're in. So let's do these safe to fail probes. It's not going to probes. It's not going to hurt. But let's do these experiments. You pilot, see how it works, and if it works, then build off of that um, instead of being um, tied to this strategic plan that might be obsolete by the time it's finished. And I'll say from a, um, a higher ed perspective, I feel like, uh, and I'm not the only one who's said this, I mean, oftentimes strategic plans are, you develop it, they're designed for five to seven years. Some people will design them for three years, which is probably be more the in the Sto Snowden school, very short, um, if he was, would even advocate for even doing one. But um, they often just get composed and sat on a shelf and some signage goes up with some core values and a, and a mission that people, you know, people may be aligned with, maybe not, you know, you never really know. Um, and I've seen different people work the strategic plan to different levels of effectiveness, you know, leadership, you know, um, I would say like tying, you know, the totally topic for a different podcast, but um, you're uh Joe, for those of you who don't know, and, you, and you, if you find Joda an, immensely attractive, he lives in Portland. Um, <laughs> he, uh, they have a community college system in Portland that uh, had a Mark Mitsui as its president for uh, many years. He's retiring now. And he was, when I worked with him at North, um, I found Mark uh, exceptional at using the strategic plan for long-term planning and budgeting because he'd tie everything to the core values you know, any decision that was made, every budgetary allocation that was made was tied to that. And that seemed like a really effective approach. But that's a kind of a different topic. I just want to make sure I threw that anecdote in. But, yeah, it seems like Snowden would be more inclined to manage by probe, right? I mean, if you're working within a complex environment. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, for me, I, 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 I rebuke that to some degree. You know, yeah. I mean, because I feel that 
And you, we might be misrep. I might just be. No, no. I, I yeah, but uh, but that was my takeaway too, to some degree. And and you know, he's obviously trying to. He's pushing a boundary in one direction, and I'm sure he. I'm gonna bet he's got some sort of moderate take on this stuff. But you know, he's 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 postulating something, so he was, he's going to be a little what bombastic. And so, but when if you, I think if you really drilled in on him, he would say, "Sir, oh no, you got to have a vision or whatever." I would think. I don't know. I could be wrong, but the. The, the idea that you're going to do a bunch of, I mean, <laughs> you're going to do a bunch of small, what are they, uh, small, safe to fail experiments, right? What is your rationale for each one of those small, safe to fail experiments? Now, he says that, uh, what's the terminology he uses? That you, um, uh, gosh darn it, I'm trying to remember. There's a, hold on a second, I got my notes here. Um, I'll find it. Um, that that you need to sort of have um, rational hypotheses, right? But if you're going to do all these sort of safe to fail experiments, where are you getting? Where are you? How are you deciding what those safe to fail experiments are, and how are you deciding if uh, how they're meaningful to you? There's got to be some thought behind them. You're not just like randomly going. Let's just throw some words together. And so, my point being is, there's some strategy, some planning there, and, and there obviously you're trying to do some safe to fail experiments because you have a vision, of, you have some perspective as to what you're trying to attain, right? So there's well, and I think that you know, like a lot of models, it's it's highly abstracted. Right and and context and context matters quite a bit, um, you know, and how, and how you apply it. Like so, for instance, I would say for I'm going to I'm going to use a situation we're in right now, being in higher ed in a post. I keep actually I use the term late stage COVID situation where uh, we're having enrollment challenges with students and having a hard time getting people coming back to campus and. Uh, people, there's still the threat of the uh, virus out there, and people have different degrees of a response to that situation. I'm not going to get into the politics of that, but it's just there. Um, and so, so as a manager in that very complex situation, you know what I, I could see having to do is setting up different experimental things to see what's going to be effective in helping the organization adapt to this emergent reality that we're in um, piloting programs. And, you know, I got a great example of, um, of this from higher ed. Uh, so we spent, I was cr- uh, working with a faculty member to create a class uh, and we spent a year doing research, planning it out, getting it approved. We thought it was going to be really well enrolled. And then, um, There was a different situation with a different faculty member. We're looking at a problem that was emerging with ESL students um, not being able to enroll because we didn't have enough seats for them in the classes. So we wanted to create this other class for them where, you know, they could at least have something to do while they were waiting to get into the regular classes. And getting back to emergence, right? It was an emergent problem. We quickly adapted, created that uh, one class for the ESL students, booming enrollment. And we made that decision in five minutes, right? Just based on the nature of the situation. The class that we took a year to plan struggles with enrollment. Interesting. You know, Interesting. and so that, I mean, that would be, I think it's a good example of, of being adaptive and letting, responding to the, the emergent situation with a pilot because that class was a pilot. You know, we didn't know if it was going to work to address the problem and luckily it did. Yeah, I think it's important for us to kind of qualify for those who don't, I mean, I think it makes sense. I think it, the words themselves probably are explaining what it is. But safe to fail experiments, meaning that you're able to perform an experiment, and if it fails, the ramifications are either null or very small. That that yeah. you that that you gain more from the uh, uh, evidentiary data um, than you might lose from um, it failing, um, and that's what safe to fail. You know, from that perspective. So, from his perspective. And again, from an agile perspective as well, you throw out all these little experiments and you um, base the, you know, you want to have measures set up. That's one of the bigger failures in this. I've, I've found oftentimes is you don't have the appropriate measures set up. So you do your experiments, but you don't actually capture the results of the experiments accurately or, or appropriately. That's a big deal, I think, in organizations. We can talk about that later or in another podcast. But, but you get those set up 
And so you get back feedback and, and assuming you've got the right measures up, you've got true data coming back, you pivot, you know, you, to, to, to utilize a classic Silicon Valley terminology, you make your pivots based upon that information. You make your adjustments and changes and you send out s- some more small probes. And so that's what this, the whole idea. So if you're in a really super complex environment where things are changing or uh, the feedback loops are, are to the point where uh, Dan does something based upon what I do, and then I do something based upon what Dan does, and then Dan's got, and so you got that sort of feedback loop, and it's really complex. You want to do these smaller sort of tests to see uh, what's what works and what doesn't work for two reasons. Like Dan was saying, time. If you do a, if I do a research project uh, that takes t- a year. Well, it was probably true for that point a year ago, but things have might have changed since then. So a smaller research yep. project can be more valid because it's more immediate. Um, and then also it's from an, from like an evolutionary perspective, we think of microorganisms being able multiple or microorganisms being able to mutate and kind of adjusting to, to stressors on the outside world. Similarly with these smaller experiments, you can kind of pivot quickly and make quick adjustments and, and kind of and do things quickly and that kind of level. So there's value in that, you know, so I think we should definitely dive deeper into that. I think there's something to be had, um, but I also think we've, we're out of time. So, yep. So uh, hope you all enjoyed that uh, brief uh, cursory uh, exploration of uh, David Stoden's uh, Kunevin uh, framework. And uh, we will definitely be exploring complexity more in future episodes. So if you like this conversation, don't uh, be dumb. shy about subscribing. If you, if you hate this conversation, you can subscribe to you, though. Honestly, I don't care. Either way. Yeah. Uh, make sure to give us five stars on uh, Apple, on Apple Podcasts, like uh, uh, Joda's fiance did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, Somebody loves tell us. Tell your mom about us. Tell your mom. We like moms. And, uh, um, and, uh, yeah, and then like, and like the video, uh, and like the podcast. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you're yeah. on YouTube, you can hit that bell and it will alert you the next time we pollute your feed with, uh, with an episode. <laughs> That's another, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. We're going to pollute, pollute, we're going to pollute you. Yeah. So. Pollute, pollute the YouTube ecosystem. Well, Dan, hey. <laughs> Dude, as as usual, good conversation. Uh, let's let's explore this. Let's let's uh, talk more later on. All right, take care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Take care.